love it. I love it. This is my home. Oh my God, this is where I started in my 20s doing comedy in New York here at Gotham. Now I'm here in my mid 30s. <laughs> my late, late, late mid 30s, guys. I'm 39 for a couple more hours, okay? For this show, I am 39. And I know what you're thinking. He doesn't look 39, right? I don't look 39, yeah. I know. I know. It's just my face, though, really. If I unbutton a button here, I'm like the red woman in Game of Thrones. I will crumble into a pile of ash and bones, yeah. People get aggressive with me when they don't believe that I'm 39. Like, I sometimes get carded at the bar, and somebody will overhear me being to the bartender, like, yeah, can you believe I'm 39? It's like, oh, cool, man. And then they'll be like, you're not 39, you're lying! I don't believe you! You're lying! You're lying! And I'm like, I didn't say that I was in Afghanistan. This isn't a stolen valor situation here, even if I were lying. But also, where's the logic in that, right? I mean, if I were gonna lie, why would I use the age 39? <laughs> oh, you're 39, gobble, 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 gobble. <laughs> so the woman tested me on it. She goes, oh yeah, you're 39? Who's the president in 1979? I go, Jimmy Carter. And that doesn't mean that I was born in 79. That means I have a third grade education now. <laughs> But like, if I was gonna test somebody to find out if they were 39, like I would be like, okay, uh, what are three rumors that only somebody who's 39 would know, right? It's like, Richard Gere shoved that gerbil up his butt. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis was born with male parts. <laughs> and Paul from The Wonder Years is Marilyn Manson, right? <laughs> and as a bonus, if you type 80085 on your beeper, that spells boobs. <laughs> yeah, that checks out, right? That checks out. I don't feel 39 either, guys. I don't. I, I feel 49 or 59. <laughs> I just want to get an age. Uh, who's in their 20s here? Come on, let me hear you. Anybody? 30s? 30s? 40s? 40s? 50s? 50s? Anybody? 60s? 70s? Dead? Dead? Did I do a ghost check? You know, the thing about getting old is there's a lot of great things, but the one thing that really troubles me is all the things that I thought were hilarious that were in my house as kids that I laughed at about my parents are now happening to me. Like the two funniest things that were always on display in my house were a heating pad and an enema bag. <laughs> I mean, those are staples for me now. I don't leave the, ho the house without them at all. Like I cannot go anywhere without those things. Uh, I, I have um, back pain, terrible. Anybody here have terrible back pain, like chronic back pain? Yeah, every everybody, everybody, right? I mean, look, but you know what they say, life begins at sciatica, right? Really, that's the... <laughs> That's true, right? I mean, you haven't lived until you have six months of chronic pain in your life, right? So uh, this is where I'm at with my back pain. I'm at, I'm at the point where, literally, this happened the other day. I was at a bar, and I dropped my credit card on the ground. And I'm at the age where I can't just bend straight down to get it. I have to kind of, like, get myself projectile down. Do you guys remember? Do you guys remember something about Mary, that guy, Tucker? Like, that's what I look like. I'm like, oh, I got it, I got it. No, no, one more try. And then I was like, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. I'm a grown man. You know, I'm 39. You know what I did? I pulled out my phone and I ordered another credit card. <laughs> like an adult. <laughs> I'm, I'm somewhat successful in comedy, but not like my friends who stayed the path. I have a lot of friends in finance and Silicon Valley. I mean, these guys are like rich, like millionaire. I hate, I hate that. I hate that. I mean, they're my friends, but I despise them. <laughs> and some of them are here and they know it. <laughs> but we don't even, we're not even on the same level of community. We don't even use the same language anymore. The other day, I swear to you, one of my friends, he goes, hey man, uh, Matt, you want to go in on a horse with us? <laughs> we're going in on a horse. Uh, I was like, I guess I'll split a horse ride with you, but I don't want to be on the back. Like, I just, I don't, are we going to be shirtless like Putin? I don't want to do that. If I can be in the front, and he goes, no, man, we're gonna like invest in a horse and we're gonna gamble on it. I'm like, I don't think you really know where I am financially. I'm closer to eating a horse than buying a horse, okay? I'm at the age, and I, like I'm not where I wanna be. I know where I'm not wanna be because I spend most of my time Googling older and older success stories. Yeah. <laughs> When I was a teenager, I was like, I'm gonna be the Doogie Howser of comedy. Now I'm like, can I be the Rodney Dangerfield of comedy, maybe? <laughs> no, 
Thomas. Yeah. But the problem is, I'm already like I've already thought past that, and I googled '50s, and it's you know who it is? Warren Buffett. It's like, oh great, now I have to become a billionaire. This is not <laughs> going in the right direction. But you know, I told you my friends are really successful. I've I've freed myself. You know, if you set lower goals, then you can free yourself from a lot of stuff. <laughs> Like, I'm no longer competing with my friends for success. My new goal, I just want to be successful before my friend's children. <laughs> and it's starting to look grim. They are really growing up fast. <laughs> my friend's five-year-old daughter in front of me, in front of my eyes, I swear this happened, she broke a wooden board with her foot. <laughs> When I was growing up, the only person in the world that could do that was Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> These kids are not soft, okay? They are not soft at all. So I just, I freaked out. I went straight to a Taekwondo studio and I was like, hey man, sensei. I, I don't think I called him man. I think I said sensei, which may be karate, I don't know. But I said, hey sensei, um, how can I get a black belt? And he goes, well, in about 10 to 20 years of rigorous mind and body training, daily discipline, you could, if you have it in you, deep in your soul, become a black belt. And I was like, no, I think I miscommunicated. I meant like, do you have a gift shop? Could I buy a black belt, preferably with like a snake or a cobra or a moon? Something cool that looks legit, you know? And then and the next time I saw this girl, so they don't, thing is, my friends don't know that their kids aren't cute to me. These are my nemesis, nemesi, nemesises. <laughs> so they bring her over, like, oh, Esty, uh, why don't you show them some piano? Why don't you play Mozart? And I was like, all right, yeah, let's do that. But first, why don't we listen to all of my podcasts, okay? <laughs> 437 episodes of Legally Insane. Check it out, guys. <laughs> After the sip of this beer, guys. I was on a plane ride over here, and uh, this guy next to me just ruined my whole plane ride. Like, I believe in plane ride etiquette. This was a 6 a.m. flight. Like, on a 6 a.m. flight, the rule is no talking whatsoever, right? Like, unless, like, the only exception to that is like, okay, I have to poop really badly, get the hell out of my way. That's it. <laughs> this guy elbows me at 6 in the morning. He goes, hey, man, check it out. Poor man's first class. I'm like, what? And I try to go back to sleep. He goes, hey man, poor man's first class. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, no middle seat, man. Poor man's first class. <laughs> and it really cut to my core, because it was like, oh, he gets me. Like, he knows there's no way I'll ever be up front, you know? But the way he said it, it was like, best two scallywags that I cost could ever do, mate. Bottom of the Titanic, but we've got our own rooms. <laughs> And I was like, uh, I don't know if you know this moron, but there's already a word for that. It's called business class, you know. <laughs> so uh, I used to be a lawyer. I don't know if some of you guys know that. Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not something you would ever want to cheer the lawyers. You know? <laughs> there's a couple here in the crowd. Uh, and then I, I switched to comedy, and so a lot of people say just really kind of offensive stuff to me. Like, I get this one a lot. What did your parents say? <laughs> quit law to do comedy? What do your parents say? Like, this isn't a 12-year-old kid telling his parents he quit the soccer team, okay? I'm a grown man. Told my parents I was quitting law to do comedy. You know what they said? Nothing. Not a word. Not a peep. They just don't talk to me at all anymore. <laughs> but I assume they're supporting me silently. You know? <laughs> but they kind of have to. At least my mom, right? Because, like, we have an unbreakable bond, right? We have an unbreakable... Because, of course, she is... My co-signer, yeah. <laughs> She's in this for life plus. I get hit by a bus tomorrow, Sally Mae is still coming after her. <laughs> she makes worse decisions than I do, okay? <laughs> People always want to know what happened. You know, like, how do you end up from law to comedy, right? They really want to know if I, if, I, if I quit or got fired. It's like, guys, I only have half a suit. You figure it out, you know? <laughs> the rest of my suit, I think, is on Storage Wars season two somewhere. <laughs> So I, I sometimes do this ambiguous thing, right? Anybody here ever been fired? Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, come on. Yeah. 
Come on, right? I mean, why are we so ashamed, right? But I do the ambiguous thing sometimes. They just high-fived on being fired. That's how you, those are the girls you want to go after, fellas. They have nowhere to be for a while. You could ask them if they want to go to Bermuda right now. They'll, they're, they're there. So I sometimes will do that thing, you know, just I don't want to get into it. I go, oh, there were layoffs. But sometimes people will really press you. Like, this guy came up to me, he's like, oh, really? How many people got laid off in that round? <laughs> I don't know the raw numbers. Uh, could give you a percentage if you want. And he's like, yeah, I would like to know. I'm like, 1% of the workforce? And he was like, oh, well, how many people work there? I was like, 100, but please don't do the math. <laughs> Can't do on that one. It's the only time in my life, that I swear, I wish that I had a lisp. Because that way I could be telling the truth, but you wouldn't know. I'd be like, there were layoffs. <laughs> Did you say layoff or layoffs? Layoff. <laughs> I got that joke from my high school. We had this kid, this kid Andy, who was in high school with us, and we were all talking about where we went to college. I went to Binghamton, some people went to Penn, some people went to Cornell. I go, Andy, where are you going to college? He goes, Harvard, and he just walks away. <laughs> and we're like, oh my God, is he smarter than all of us? This dumbass is smarter than all of us? And then we found out he went to Hartford College. <laughs> I submit that that is the best use of a lisp ever. <laughs> Move over, Barbara Walters. <laughs> and then his mom started having a lisp. My son goes to Harvard. The whole family <laughs> started having lisps. Hartford alums, genius. Uh, they're geniuses over there. <laughs> you guys want to know how I got fired? Yeah. Okay. But I just need to know, like, if you, you know, know something. Like, have you guys heard of cocaine? <laughs> just a little context. It's good. Okay, we're good. Okay, we're good. So the thing about being a, I was a, the biggest law firm in the world, and I think there's a, like certain things. You, like, you can either close a billion dollar deal or do an eight ball of cocaine. You can't do both. That's just, they're mutually exclusive, okay? I chose the cocaine. But I did get back to the office. It was early morning. I got back to the office and I got there like early. It was like six in the morning, nowhere to go. I slide under my desk, take a little nap and I missed the entire closing, the whole thing. And this partner walks in and he's furious. He goes, God damn it, Matt, are you wasted? And like, why would you even say that? <laughs> Meanwhile, my feet were just dangling out from the desk like a car mechanic. So I was like, oh, I'm just fixing some of the under here. Like, uh, can you get me the screwdriver? He's like, which one, the Phillips head? I'm like, no, no, the vodka one over there on my desk. <laughs> I go, why would you really think that I'm wasted? I'm like, well, like you have no evidence. He goes, look at your shoes. I swear to you, I was wearing one black shoe and one brown shoe to work. But I was a lawyer, I was smart, I go, well, it's because I'm colorblind and under ADA section 425B section CX1, you can't fire me. <laughs> he goes, look again. I swear to you, I had one brown loafer and one black lace up on my shoe. That's how you know the drugs were good, guys. So they didn't fire me there. It was unbelievable. I'm like, what? what's happening right now? So they. A couple weeks later, they, had, they put this meeting on the books, these two partners, Bob and Glenn, and they come into my office and they sit down and they got this folder that had more pages in it than any work I'd ever done the entire time I was at my firm. <laughs> and they go, do you know how many hours you built this year, Matt? And I was just like, I was supposed to keep track of that? What? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, maybe I just watched too many 80s movies because like, I knew what happened next. I just got on my knees and I was like, I will suck your dick to keep this job. <laughs> And Glenn was like, no, 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 there's gonna be no sucking. Oh, like, oh, Bob, okay, it's you. I'll suck your dick. And I could tell he was sort of into it because his hand was on his zipper. He's like, yo, just lock the door. Give me four minutes. And Bob was like, no, no, no. So <laughs> they go, we're gonna give you a severance package, right? Like I was ready to blow two dudes. And instead, they gave me $40,000. <laughs> Let me repeat that. I was about to blow two dudes and they gave me $40,000. This is the greatest country in the world, guys. Yeah, the whoever came up with the severance package is a genius, okay? 
because I was ready to get out of there. I was going to steal a couple of items, like a couple of laptops and a flat screen, and I was gone. <laughs> they could have had me for three grand, and I got 40. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing if all life worked like that? Like, all relationships ended with a severance, not just marriage. Like, even if a casual, like, six-month fling, you know? Girl's like, you cheating piece of scum. I want you out of my life right now. But before you go, here's 12 blowjobs. <laughs> That ought to tide you over till winter. Oh, I'll clean your room twice, yeah, sure. That's the world I wanna live in, guys, I don't know. So I, I, I lost it on this older gentleman the other day uh, asking me about job stuff. He, he asked me if I, I quit or I got fired. I was like, what are you asking? Like, am I a winner or a loser? That's really what you wanna know, right? Like, that's what you're asking when you say that. I'm like. Why the hell do you need to know the answer to that question? How is that relevant to the conversation we're having right now? <laughs> and he looked around the room, and he looked at me, and he goes, because this is a job interview, Matt. <laughs> you just slid me your resume. I was like, I don't want to work at this Urban Outfitters anyway. Okay? It's a toxic work environment. Guys, if you ever uh, worried about a gap on your resume, because I have quite a few, I figured out the solution. If you ever have a long gap, like a five-year gap on your resume because you were finding yourself, because we're white, that's what white people do, we find ourselves. <laughs> like we're allowed to find ourselves and have a huge gap on our resume. <laughs> if that happens, I figured it out, right? Because like, if you have a five, you just go into the interview, you gotta be really confident, right? If the interview goes, oh, I see this five-year gap from 2014 to 19, like what were you doing? You just look them dead in the eye and you go, I was in a coma. Because <laughs> who's gonna question you after that, right? And if you're a lawyer, you go, but my wife read to me every day from the ABA journal. I'm up on my case law. I absorbed it. I soaked it in. I'm ready. Put me in, coach. Guys, I'm married. Where are the married people at? That's the most excited I've ever seen a crowd be for that. That's good, that's happy marriage stuff. My wife, I love her, beautiful woman. We got in a bit of a fight. Amazing woman, but we got in a bit of a fight the other day over finances, or she thought it was over finances. We live in LA. We got in a little fight because we decided once we get married, we have to agree on big purchases, right? You can't just do something without the other person. We made a carve out. We said if it's on Amazon Prime, you don't have to consult with the other person because by the time you even talk to them, it's already at your house. It's already there. It's already there. It's too late, you know? I was like, it's too late. The cornhole said it's here. What are you gonna do? But we don't have a yard, so she was a little upset about that because I kind of hit her in the head with a bean bag when she walked in. So she was like, send it back. So she was mad at me, but then I got really mad at her because she without asking me, went online and bought one of those earthquake survival backpacks <laughs> for $300. She got an earthquake survival backpack and we got in a huge fight. I'm like, I can't believe you. She's like, what? It's important, okay? It's important. It's not that much money. Don't be so cheap. I'm like, honestly, I'm not mad about the money. She's like, what are you mad about? I'm mad that you only bought one <laughs> earthquake survival backpack. What about old Matty boy? She was probably like, oh, he's got a bad back. He'll never survive the apocalypse. I want a man with a strong back to fight off the zombies and carry my backpack. <laughs> you know what made me so upset is then I went on Amazon Prime. Do you know what they recommend when you order an earthquake survival backpack? Another earthquake survival backpack <laughs> for your loved one. <laughs> I gotta be honest, guys. Actually, it's even worse. The default on Amazon Prime is earthquake survival backpacks for two. <laughs> she skipped past three pages of a happy couple surviving the apocalypse together. Like, yeah, we did it, we made it. She went to the fourth page with survival backpacks for one, which Amazon Prime recommends Six months on Bumble for free. <laughs> and then she tried, to, she tried to play it off. She's like, oh, come on, you know, come on. If you know if anything happened, we'd sh we'll share it. We'll just share it. <laughs> Every married guy in this room knows that you will share that earthquake survival backpack the way Jack and Rose shared that piece of wood at the end of the Titanic. 
Hey, Rose, you mind if I take a turn? No, no, go to your side. What's my side? The water, that's your side. I'm gonna meditate and you sleep and we'll see you in the morning. It took Rose like an hour to realize Shaq was at the bottom of the Atlantic, guys. I like to do Titanic references, topical stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> I wrote that joke when I was 12. What do you want me to do? I had to wait to get married. So, are there any single people here? Yeah! I like that. You're like, you raise your hand so you can find each other. That's good. <laughs> Get the apps out, you know, the location stuff. Uh, so I think there's a misconception about sex with single people and married people. Single people, they think they're, the best thing about being single is like, oh, you can have sex whenever you want. Like, that's the whole thing, right? Um, but I think that's actually, the worst part is actually like, at least for a guy, you also have to have sex when you don't want, when you're not feeling well, right? Every married person in this room knows that you can opt out of sex at any time if you're both not feeling in peak shape. <laughs> Olympic shape, peak. But when you're single, especially as a guy, right, you could be like three burritos deep at three in the morning and you get that text, you up? You're like, yeah, I'll be right over. I just gotta get my flu shot, okay? And then you come over and you're just like on top of somebody, a human being, trying not to throw a burrito on a girl. Like, like what must that look like? A monster on top, like a monster. So then as a gentleman, you run to the bathroom and you're about to throw up, so you turn on the shower, or you turn on the hair dryer, you turn on the curling iron because you think it makes noise. <laughs> And then you throw up, and then you come right back as if nothing happened. You're like, where were we? Oh, <laughs> uh, I just ordered you an Uber, dude. Get the hell out of my apartment, you monster. <laughs> but married people, we don't have to deal with that, right? I mean, we don't do that. That's ridiculous. That's single person problems. My wife and I, we have sex on Sundays in the late afternoon, like 4 p.m. after 18 hours of sleep. <laughs> Middle of the bed, no rough stuff, nobody gets hurt. <laughs> Shower sex, like we, we don't, I don't even think we have insurance. That's crazy talk. <laughs> it's just lunacy. <laughs> we were going hot and somewhat heavy, and all of a sudden, I felt a foot cramp coming on. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out, pass me the Ben Gay, get the eating pad, but also turn on the AC, turn on Game of Thrones, and we will pick this up next Sunday. So get married, single people, get married. Get married. I grew up uh, in, a, in a shithole town on Long Island called Plainview. It's not, it's not a horrible place, it's just, it's just like, they didn't even have enough pride in their name, like Plainview. <laughs> oh, can we call ourselves Averageville? Is Ordinary Town taken? <laughs> Homely people land? <laughs> so, <laughs> my, my parents did this thing, and I think it was like a good thing to do. They told us we were middle class. Like we were hanging on to that lower rung of lower middle class. <laughs> like we were just clinging to that lowest rung of lower middle class. And I know this, I'll tell you why I know this. One, because we got lice a lot. Some kids get lice one or two times. We got lice nine times in my house. Nine times. I'm 39, I just did it, 23 and me. It came back 20% rodent. Specifically Eastern European bubonic plague rodent. The Jews came over with the lice, you know, that's you know, a little shtetl. They brought it with them to Plainview. My dad's an immigrant. Love my dad, great guy. He came over and I realized that, you know, they, they make you swear a couple of oaths uh, when you come to Ellis Island. The one is to America, everybody knows about that, but they also make you swear an oath to only watch CBS procedurals. <laughs> CSI and NCIS only. Like, when we're hanging out, like, he'll just recite the plot of any episode <laughs> involving Mark Harmon or LL Cool J. <laughs> but on the phone, my dad and I, Israeli immigrant, we've never had a phone conversation that lasts longer than 59 seconds. <laughs> Ever, in my entire life. And what I realized is, I think what's happening is, he actually thinks, because he watches so much NCIS, that they are tracing the call, <laughs> and that if he doesn't get off with me in 59 seconds or less, something bad will happen to him. <laughs> this is our standard call. I'm like, hey, what's up, dad? He goes, good. 
uh, what's going on? He goes, Mets suck, Knicks suck, Giants suck. <laughs> True. <laughs> what, are you, what are you up to? Are you home? He goes, yes, no, no. <laughs> Where are you? He goes, Queens, no, no, Cincinnati, no, no, no. Columbus, no, no, no. Brazil, bye. <laughs> Like, I don't know, maybe Mark Harmon is after my dad. I have no idea. It may be. I work out of one of those shared workspaces. Are you guys familiar with these, the WeWorks? Yeah. I hate it so much. I don't know, maybe it's because I grew up poor and I want to be rich and it didn't happen. It's like, what I don't want is this communist socialist stuff. I don't want it. I want my own stuff. I was a middle child. I was promised my own stuff and I never got it. <laughs> like, you know, oh, you'll, you know, I share a room with my older brother and I got his hand-me-downs. I share a room with my younger sibling. I got her hand-me-ups. <laughs> she was bigger than me, yeah. <laughs> my mom was like, blue's a neutral color. I'm like, on a cheerleading outfit, really, is it? <laughs> I was a little village person. It was great. It was fun. So, so at the WeWork that I go to, I don't even have my own assigned desk. I, they, they call it a hot desk. A hot desk. It's hot because somebody was just sitting in it. I feel their hot ass. And the thing about it is, I gotta be honest, I am a farter. Big time. Big time. Fart all the time. And the thing is, is that when you don't have your own office and you're just in this communal area, there's nowhere to go. You're like, oh, nope, the person there, person there. Okay, uh, hold it in, right? But you could die from that. Everybody knows if you hold it up far too long, you will die. <laughs> so I figured out a solution. It's very juvenile. I just point to the first person I, that I think could be a farter or two. And the second I let one rip, I just go, he farted, get him out of here, he's gross, get him out of here. But the people at this socialist commune, they go, no, no, Matt, there's no blame here. If somebody farted, we all farted. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I guess I should tell you that we all clogged the bathroom on the seventh and eighth floors. <laughs> You guys having fun? <laughs> People always ask me how I met my wife because she's stunning and I'm just like, whatever, blah, you know? <laughs> Which I find insulting because like, they wouldn't, if I had money or I had a huge penis, they wouldn't ask me that. They know that I, like they know that I don't have those two things, which is really annoying. It's like, what else do you have, man? I got stuff. No, people always want to know how I met her. Uh, it was a basic catfish. Just your basic standard <laughs> garden variety catfish. But not the looks one, okay? Like, I didn't send her a picture of Tom Brady and it's like, here I am. No, the one that most people use. Like, everybody talks about the looks one, but really, personality catfishing is what we all do, right? I mean, that's the big one. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying you should lie when you're in a relationship but you have to lie to get in one. I mean, that's the only way. That is the only way. All the single people here, that's the absolute only way. I will tell you, because I remember I used to get all this bad advice, right? It would always be like, you know, why am I single? It'd be like, no, no, you're fine, you're fine. Just be yourself. Somebody will love you for who you are. No, they won't. I'm me, I'm not George Clooney. What are you talking about? No, you have to, listen, the truth is you just have to pretend to be a much better version of yourself for as long as you possibly can until they say I love you and then you slowly release the crappier version of you, but slowly. You know, but slowly you let them back in a little bit like, you know, the real, you know, the Kardashian watcher, the one who doesn't do any charity, the one who doesn't read any books, the one who just smells horribly all the time, the real you. It, this is a true story. We were like three years into our relationship and my wife goes, Whatever happened to that uh, Big Brothers of America thing you did? <laughs> I was like, oh, you mean Brother Jimmy's? <laughs> the place I used to go get barbecue and watch football with my friends. 
She goes, no, no, Big Brothers of America, you said you helped all those kids. I was like, oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, you know what? I gotta come clean about that. Big Brothers of America has been shut down. <laughs> what can I say, I helped them all. No more orphans, they're gone. <laughs> I did it, it's over. Oh my God, guys, this is so fun. So I, uh, so we got married, but we were definitely like different types. She grew up wealthy, and I grew up in, you know, like lower middle rung I told you about. But also like I was a partier, and the thing is about like who you are, right? Do you guys think you can change, right? Like I, I, I'd like to think you can change. I like to think I'm like a grown up. You know, you know who will never let you change? Your high school friends, ever. <laughs> Whatever you were to those people, doesn't matter if you're 40, right? So I was the crazy guy, and that's how they think of me. Like, that's it. No matter what I say or do. Like, I know this, because I travel around the country. The other day, I called up my friend, and I was like, hey, I'm going to be in Chicago. I'd love to see you, man. I haven't seen you in forever. And he just immediately was like, I don't do that stuff anymore, man. <laughs> I'm married. I got a family to think about. I got a job. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm not a Navy SEAL sniper asking you to go out on one last mission, dude. I literally just asked if you and your wife want to go to the farmer's market. <laughs> Which, incidentally, is a daytime strip club in Chicago. It's a great name for the receipts, guys. But so I was the crazy guy. That's who I was. So um, when I met my wife, like, she's very classy. Like, I'm the guy, I'll be doing keg stands till I vomit, right? Like, that's what I was doing, like, in my early 30s. <laughs> a little too late to be at high school parties doing that, guys. Frank the Tank type kind of guy. My wife, very classy, like the type of a lady who goes up to Napa with her friends, does the wine tasting with the pinky up, <laughs> says stuff like, I taste butterscotch. It's like, no you don't, you just had a Werther's original, you dummy. <laughs> it's not what you're tasting. So, but now I'm like, oh, we gotta compromise, right? I mean, that's the thing about marriage, you kind of have to meld into kind of one person, but you also have to be yourself a little bit. So now, I go with her, and I do the wine tasting in Napa, I do all the fancy stuff, but I always make sure that I vomit in that little silver bucket. <laughs> I drink so much in between the white and the red, like the sommelier's like, what's next? I'm like, Aah! He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, me, I'm, I'm cleansing my palate over here. Does anybody taste Domino's? Is that just me? <laughs> I taste garbage, does anybody? <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this bit's gonna be a little controversial. This might touch a raw nerve with some of you. So, <laughs> I, I wanna talk about engagement rings for a second. I think you have two options, okay? This is just very strong feelings that I have. I think you can either get a big ring so your wife isn't humiliated for the rest of her life when she walks around, or don't get a ring at all, okay? If you're cool enough to pull off no ring, be the guy who gets the hemp necklace. Like, oh yeah, I got her a hemp necklace, we're married now, what? <laughs> uh, we got a candy necklace. Yeah, we went to, you know, Joshua Tree, did some ayahuasca. Now we're married. What? <laughs> the rest of us, we have to subscribe to society's rules. Society says you got to get a big ring. You got to get a big ring, right? And I'm not saying you have to get an expensive ring, right? You can get one at Costco, right? Nobody's walking around with a loop. Like, is that a G? Is that a D? Like, where'd you get that? Oh, it's an heirloom. From who? Uh, Uncle Coscovius. Yeah, he's Greek. <laughs> he's Greek. But if you're gonna, like, I t I'm not, listen, I wanna say I'm not rich. I borrowed money from my mom <laughs> for this. It was a blood diamond. I was like, mom, I need the money. She's like, no, your wife, she'll love you for who you are. I'm like, no, that's what you do. You love me unconditionally. Her love is conditional by the size of this ring. It's very conditional. She'll love me more and more. The bigger and bigger the ring is. So I got a blood diamond. I was like, who cleans the blood off? Do I just clean it off? Do I get... I'll take, if it's less, I'll, I'll do it myself. You can, listen, if you want to get a, a small ring, fine. Like, I don't fault you for making horrible life decision, okay? That's you, but you got to own it then. Have you seen these couples? They don't own it, right? I, I, I was with this couple and they were just like, have you ever seen this? This couple, we have a small ring and they're embarrassed about it and they go, you're like, can, you see, can I see your ring? Oh, is, can I see your ring? Like, oh, no, don't even look at that one. Don't even look at that one. We're gonna get a bigger one later. We're gonna get a bigger one later. I'm like, yes, she is. From her second husband. <laughs> who knows better. 
And you know what they're gonna do with your ring? Wear it as a baguette on his dick. As a cock ring. On Sunday afternoons, they're gonna be like, can we put Jeremy in? <laughs> Don't do that. Guys, that was a PSA. I'm sponsored by De Beers, everybody. <laughs> sponsored comic. Uh, my wife was out of town, though, and I, um, I had to go to a wedding without her, and uh, I had to share a room with a couple. <laughs> they were like, oh, come on, you know, we know you're struggling. Like, come on, just share. I'm like, it's true, fine, fair. I'm like, but. I don't know, is this weird? And they're like, oh, come on, you mean like that? Like, we don't even, we don't even do that stuff. We've been married for a decade, we don't even do that stuff anymore. <laughs> Turns out they do. <laughs> I mean, literally, in under the time that it takes to get off the phone with my dad, <laughs> after lights out, they started going at it. <laughs> and I don't know for sure if they were having sex, but they were either having sex or that same exact weird dream. <laughs> You know that one that goes, uh, shh, uh, shh, uh, shh, you're gonna wake up Matt. I don't care, he should get a real job. <laughs> it was the most uncomfortable thing that happened that night. No, 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 no. It was the second most uncomfortable thing that happened that night. The most uncomfortable, of course, was me pretending to be asleep while quietly jerking off to them having sex. <laughs> oh, they're like, who said that? I'm like, it's too late. Everybody come on three. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Brunch the next day. <laughs> I gotta tell you, brunch the next day with my sister and her husband was super awkward. <laughs> kidding, you guys are disgusting. You really thought I would do that? It was my parents, guys, come on. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. My wife and I do that to other people. That's the only way we can get off, guys. I'm gonna tell a story about Las Vegas and then uh, we'll get out of here. How does that sound? Yeah. Uh, again, same group of girls, right? They'll, they'll go to Vegas right now. So I did Vegas for my bachelor party, uh, but my friends, like, I don't know what was going on with them. They were proposing all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, it's not on brand for me. One of my buddies was like, oh, I think maybe we should go to Ojai or something. <laughs> I was like, are we planning my wife's bachelorette party? Is that what's happening? <laughs> they were like, well, what about Charleston? I heard that's the new hot spot. <laughs> what about Nashville? I heard that's the hot spot. I'm like, did they move all the hookers and cocaine to Nashville? <laughs> no? Well, then we're going to Vegas. Listen, I love my wife. I just wanted to have like a regular bachelor party time. I didn't want to do anything really bad. I just wanted to go to a strip club and have like a 65-year-old stripper with like stab wounds on her chest <laughs> sit on my lap and tell me she's paying her way through college, you know? <laughs> just a regular scumbag bachelor party. <laughs> but my friends, they don't know how old we are. They don't realize that we are just a bunch of old 39-year-old losers. <laughs> They decided to do the daytime pool party in Las Vegas. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what this is, this is like the best and worst achievement in world history, okay? It's like the Coliseum and every Game of Thrones fight scene all in one, okay? There's like thousands of people just like stomping to get in at 11 a.m. and there's just like house music that just sounds like a horn. It's like, doo doo! As a Jew, all I hear is tequila! Or maybe that was the Molly. I don't know. But I was like, what is going on here? So everybody just charges into this pit, the middle pit, these young, sh shredded Vikings. And they're all going, like, much like Game of Thrones, they're all rushing into the pit to die, to die. Not from stab wounds, but from STDs. But nonetheless, they will all die. But we are like the older lords, right? We got a cabana in the back, and we're just like, bring us your finest wenches, dead or alive. <laughs> but my friends thought we were there in the cabana for the girls and the drinks. I was just there, this is where I'm at in life. I just wanted the cabana to avoid melanoma. <laughs> There's no shade. Everybody in there is dancing. No sunblock. They're like, and we're gonna die young. Uh, <laughs> like, yes, you will if you don't get that irregular birthmark checked out. What is that? 
You need SPF 10,000 right now. I mean, there should be a dermatologist in the pool just snipping people as it happens, just snipping the parts as they grow. <laughs> so, so we're in the cabana, and the thing is, is it like, I knew we were too old for this because we, we were too embarrassed to take our shirts off, okay? <laughs> you should, you should, we had matching shirts because we just didn't want to take our shirts off. <laughs> we're too old, you know? We're like, we used to be swole. Now we're swollen. Like, <laughs> one of my friends is so fat, his face is so fat, I accidentally stabbed him in the face with an EpiPen. <laughs> I thought he was having an allergic reaction to bees. <laughs> he was just like, no, this is what I look like now. I'm like, God. You look horrible. That EpiPen might help in some way. I don't know. It could still reduce the swelling of your face. <laughs> it's amazing. But the thing that is, it's just incredible. I mean, it's the, the most majestic sight I've ever seen is the ability of any group of girls, any group of 12, 20 something girls, the ability to decimate your entire $10,000 vodka supply in a matter of seconds. <laughs> Seconds. It is the most, I mean, honestly, have you guys seen BBC Planet Earth? <laughs> it reminded me of this thing I watched on these locusts. They just come and they destroy billions of crops in a matter of seconds. That's what this looked like. It was like, boom, 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 boom. And you look over and there's just a row of 40 year old losers just decimating. <laughs> oh, did they get you too? They hit us, man. Wiped us out clean. <laughs> the worst part is some of my friends were like, us next, come to us next. <laughs> I mean, it was like watching a fish have a shark come after, like, us next, come kill us. And we're just sitting there just like sucking on leftover Red Bull, just hoping for some backwash of vodka. And you could see, like, and the sad thing is it only took like one 22-year-old girl with a lower back tattoo to talk to us. She's like sent out to talk to us. Like, Jessica, show them your tattoo. And they're like, ah! And they're like talking to each other as they chug the bottles. Like, should we save some for these losers? No, finish it! And then they just move on. And we're like, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> I mean, it's like whale watching too, because it's like they literally come for three minutes and then the rest of the four hours, you're just standing there like, oh, maybe we'll see another one. <laughs> no, we only paid for one $10,000 ticket, guys. That's it. Guess we got to talk to each other now. Thank God for the... I can't hear anybody anyway. <laughs> and so my friends, they got mad at me at my own bachelor party because I told these girls our age. Maybe I shouldn't have done that on second thought. But anyway, so I told them our age and then they left. And they were like, they left because you told them our age. I'm like, nah, I think that's correlation. I don't know if that's causation, guys. <laughs> I'm like, it's transactional, guys. The Tito's is gone, they gone. That's how it works. <laughs> they're already on the west wing of Dre's clearing it out over there, okay? They're gone. And they're like, no, man. It's because you, I'm like, it's transactional. I'm like, do you guys go to McDonald's, get your food from the drive-thru, and then hang out with the guy in the window? <laughs> We're the McDonald's drive-thru guys of Vegas. <laughs> So they were, they were convinced. They were convinced that it was my fault. They were like, they left because you told them our age. I'm like, I got news for you, man. They knew our age. He goes, because you told them. I'm like, no, because you're wearing a knee brace to the pool in Las Vegas. Because there are three guys with comb overs hiding from the wind. Because you're wearing a class of 97 t-shirt talking to a girl born in 97. Thank you guys. That's my <laughs>